Good morning, Cross Point. That's good. We do this every week, right? So you know when I come up, you're ready with the good morning. You were ready this morning. That's great. We're glad to see everyone that's here in the worship center, and uh, we welcome those who are uh, following us online, either live or later in the week, and we're glad that each and every one of us are together. Uh, if you're here in the room, uh, if you picked up a, a, a worship folder, there's a connection card there, and we would like you to fill that out, if you would, and place it in the giving boxes. There's a giving box straight out between the exits this direction or over near the exit under the clock out through the Connection Center. We appreciate your faithful giving uh, to the work of, of the church. We don't collect an offering during the services, so we encourage you to use the giving box or online giving, or some have mailed uh, their uh, contributions in throughout the week. We appreciate any way that you uh, give and support, and uh, we're glad you're here. We welcome our guests with us, anyone that's here. Uh, for the first time, we welcome you, and we really encourage you to fill out that connection card, put your contact information there uh, so that we can learn to know you a little bit and glad that, that you're here with us this morning. Let's stand together as we begin the service, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for your goodness and grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we know that you're in control of all things, despite all that is happening in this world. There seems to be so much turmoil and disease and disaster, but Lord, we just place it in your hand. Lord, we pray for the people of Iswanti, the, the former Swaziland, and our missionaries there. We think of uh, Dorcas Croft, John Croft's sister who is there and uh, they had to leave because of unrest in, in the city and, and the danger that, that was there at, at their campus. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd be with them, that you would restore peace, and that they would be able to return back to their work and people return to their homes. We pray for the people of Haiti who have suffered so much through the years, and now with the assassination of their president and another uprising against the government. We pray, Lord, that you would just be with the people there. We understand that the um, Delta version of COVID is also passing through Haiti, and Lord, we just pray that you would be with the people there and that you would help them and strengthen them and give them health. We, we thank you, Lord, for Virsen in India and the good relationship that we have with him and with his family. We pray, dear Lord, that your hand would be upon them. We pray that you would uh, restore the people in their area to health and that they'll be able to get back to their ministry of ministering to people in their community, as well as reopening the school. We pray for the expansion of the school, the land that they need. We just pray, Lord, for your provision and everything that they need there in India. We pray for the pickets and uh, northern Mozambique where so many People have uh, had to flee their home and flee their city because of persecution and um, uprising. We pray, Lord, that you would just be with them, be with the pickets as they provide leadership there at the Bible College and uh, to the pastors of that area. We just pray that your hand would be upon them. Lord, we pray for our people who are facing uh, many difficult diseases and procedures and all the things that... Um, that our people are facing. We, we think especially of those who are battling cancer. We pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon them. Give them strength. Give their doctors wisdom. Uh, give their families uh, the compassion that they need to, to care for them and to help them during these difficult times. We just pray that you'd be with each of them. Be with those who are shut in and are not able to get out to church. And They love their church, but they're not able to get here. They're not able to go very far at all, some may be not even able to go out of their homes or uh, wherever they may be living in long-term care. We just pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon them and, and that you would strengthen them. Lord, we pray for revival in our own nation. We prayed for the world this morning, but Lord, our own nation needs revival. We need uh, repentance. We need to turn back to you. We need to uh, admit that we have turned against you as a people. And Lord, we pray that uh, you would restore us as a nation 
and that we would uh, be able to see a great and mighty revival among our nation, and especially among our youth. Revival throughout history has always been spearheaded by young people. And we pray, Lord, for our young people and our young adults, Lord, that you would give them a hunger and a thirst for God and for the things of God. Lord, we pray for our local church and for the process of finding the next pastor. We pray, Lord, for our district superintendent as he leads and for Kevin Kleppinger as he serves as vice chair and for all of our board members. We pray, Lord, for this time of transition that you would give the board wisdom, uh, not only in finding a, a new pastoral leader, but also to keep the ministry moving forward during these, uh, this period of time of transition. Lord, we pray that by the time another pastor is, is uh, appointed, that uh, the church would be further ahead than what we are today. And Lord, we just pray that many, many would come to know Jesus as a result of, of this church. We pray that you would be with us right now in this service. We gather here in your name to worship you. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to lift our hearts, lift our hands, lift our voices, help us to praise the Lord, for you alone are worthy. May you be glorified in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready to worship this morning? That's good. Okay. That's keep, that's, the, the word enthusiasm means in God. We want to be enthusiastic in our worship of the Lord this morning. God bless you.
The life of a Christ follower isn't easy. You don't need me to tell you that. Following Christ is tough. It's hard to go against the crowd. You face all kinds of challenges when you stand up for your faith. People making fun of you, people calling you judgmental, closed-minded, hateful, or people ignoring you altogether. What are you to make of these challenges? What's the point of these trials? 1 Peter 1, 7 through 8 says this. These have come so that your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The trials you experience because of Christ, they're meant to strengthen your faith and to prove to you and everyone else that your devotion to Christ is sincere. Wanna know what else? Your faith in the face of trials shows the world that Christ is worth standing up for. And God is ultimately faithful. He will see you through the challenges and He will be there for you through it all. He will not let you fail. He will not leave you. He will see you through until the end. Living for Christ isn't easy, but it's your faithful living that draws people to Christ. It's how you tell the world that Christ is worth following. Amen. It's great to be together in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I remember early in my ministry, uh, we had Sunday evening services at the church. We had Sunday morning, and then we'd come back again in the evening. And I had announced that I was going to be preaching a sermon series on the Old Testament in the Sunday evening services. And I was approached by a woman in the church. She wasn't old, but she was not young. She was kind of in the middle there somewhere, probably 40-ish. She had a son that was getting ready to go to college, so she was, she was in the middle. But uh, she came up to me and she said, Pastor, I'm not coming back on Sunday nights until you're finished with all this old stuff you're going to be talking about. She said, I want to hear what's new and fresh, not the old stuff. I think what that indicated, even though that was decades ago, was the scriptural illiteracy of people in the church. She'd been around the church for years. She was viewed as a mature Christian. But the Old Testament isn't old because of years. It's the Old Covenant. Jesus brought the New Covenant. But it's all one story of God's redeeming grace, salvation that comes to us. And in the Old Covenant, it was through the shedding of the blood of animals that people had forgiveness of sin. And that had to be repeated over and over and over again. You can read about it in the book of Hebrews. In the New Testament, Jesus came and he died once for everyone. It didn't have to be repeated. He did it one time and it covered our sins. But as we think about the Old Testament scriptures, the Apostle Paul wrote something that's very important for us to realize in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For everything, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. There is a reason and a purpose over 2,000 years after Jesus came into this world for us to read the Old Testament. And there's much that we can gain from the biblical stories of the Old Testament. They are intended to teach us, to give us endurance, to give us encouragement, to give us hope. Who doesn't need those things today? We need all of that. And that is why we have the Old Testament scriptures. When I was away on my medical leave this year, I prepared sermon series all the way through to next June, a sermon schedule. 
I work on six, two six-month sermon schedules, one that starts in January and goes to June, another that starts in July and goes to the end of the year. And so when I realized that I was going to be retiring, uh, instead of trying to pack all of that in, I'm just taking sermons here and there out of what I would have attended. And what my, in, nor, uh, my initial uh, in, intention was that we were going to go look week after week after week at a number of different of these Old Testament stories that are just glossed over in the book of Hebrews, but we, we would go deeper in those. And so I'm not going to be able to do all of that, but last week we talked about uh, Moses and leadership by faith, and today we want to talk about Joshua, courageous faith. Courageous faith. If we're going to have faith, and live by faith in 2021 and moving into the future, we are going to need courageous faith. Many of us are old enough to remember when the culture around us accepted and, and kind of submitted to Christian moral ethics, even if they weren't Christians. But that's what guided our nation. That is not true any longer. Matter of fact, our general superintendent just in the past week responding to some of the things that came out of, of Washington uh, about uh, equality and, so, and, and some of those things puts a great burden on religious freedom. And so just gathering here as we move forward in the future is going to be not only anti-cultural, but in some ways it is, it is going to become uh, anti government and and maybe someday even against the law and so we need courageous faith as we look to the future i want us to get, to get our minds set not on what is past oh we live in a christian nation that's long gone we live in a nation that is trying to attack the church and the freedoms that we have and so there's several things that i want us to notice from Joshua. And if you get Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, you'll be able to follow along. I, I have other supporting scriptures, but if you follow along in those verses, Joshua 1, 1 to 11, you'll be able to follow along with a, a lot of what is said. Matter of fact, there are three particular verses where these words, be strong and courageous, are addressed by God to Joshua, and they apply to us. The first one is be strong and courageous to move in the into the future God provides for you. Be strong and courageous to move into the future God provides for you. That's found in Joshua 1, 6. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Joshua, Joshua was told, that he was, first of all, he was going to lead in place of Moses. Today, the Jewish people still look back to Moses as being the greatest leader because of him delivering them, as we talked about last week, coming out of Egypt. And uh, they, they look at him as, as a great leader. And what a responsibility it was for Joshua, to, for God to say to him, Moses, my servant, is dead. Be strong and courageous because you're up next. You're going to lead these people. Now, he had been an assistant to Moses, and he had proved his faith long ago, early uh, in the wilderness experience, when there were 12 spies that were sent into the promised land, and only Joshua and Caleb come back with good reports. The other 10 said, we can't do this. We're not going to make it. They're, they're going to destroy us. They're they're big, they're huge, they're strong, they're powerful. They are people of war. And here we are, we're just, we're just slaves that have just been able to cross over the Red Sea. We, we can't do it. But Joshua and Caleb said, we can do it. Not we in our strength, but God can do it for us. And, and he had strong faith. And, and so Moses chose him to be his assistant. And God said to him, you're going to take the people where the great leader Moses couldn't. In Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, after the death 
of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joseph, to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you will and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. Moses led them all the way up to where you could see the Jordan and see into Canaan. But he died on the mountain because rather than giving God glory for delivering the people and giving them water in the desert, he got angry with the people because they griped and complained and whined over and over and over again. You brought us out here to die. Think of all the good stuff that was in the gardens back in Egypt. There's not enough food. There's not enough water. And Moses just got tired of it, and he took his staff, and instead of speaking to the rock that, the way that God had told him to, he, he hit the rock in anger, and God said, you're not going to be able to lead the people into the promised land. And so now he's telling Joshua, not only are you going to lead the people in place of the great leader Moses, but you're going to lead the people where Moses couldn't take them. And he, he was going to lead the people of Israel across the Jordan at flood stage in Joshua Chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. And when they had crossed over, while the Ark of the Covenant held by the priest was still in the, water, the riverbed of the Jordan, God said to Joshua, get one man from every tribe to get a stone. Twelve tribes get twelve stones and bring them out to set up a memorial. And so they did. And then when the Ark of the Covenant was carried out by the priests, the water flowed back together again. And they put up this memorial. Memorials are important. We're living in a time of cancer, of cancel culture. When when I was younger, I used to think no one will ever be able to deny the Christian heritage of America because it's carved into marble and concrete in our nation's capital and in many places across our nation. But we're living in a time that what's carved there doesn't matter. They want to destroy it. They want to tear it down. They want to, what, they want to get rid of it. I want to say this. That's very short-sighted. Do we think that just because we live in 2021 that what we do is better than what history has shown? And what makes us think 50 years from now or 100 years from now or 10 years from now that what we build will not be destroyed if that's what we're going to do? The memorial was important, and here's the reason why. In Joshua chapter 4, verses 18 to 24, it says, And the priests came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that had been taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until 
we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. It's our responsibility, all of us who are alive and adults today, to teach the next generation the truths of God's word, both Old Testament and New Testament, so that they have a foundation. When all of our culture is screaming against Scripture, that they will have a foundation of Scripture, not necessarily a physical memorial, but that they will have a spiritual inheritance that is based on God's word. Not only would he cross the Jordan with the people, but Joshua also would bring down the walls of Jericho. And he would do that without using any military weapons. Once a day for six days, they would walk around the city and nothing would happen. And then on the seventh day, they walked around seven times. Now, this was millions of people that were walking around. They followed the Ark of the Covenant. The military was there, but they didn't have weapons, and they just walked around the city. Can you imagine? I mean, these are the, these are the children of the people that murmured and died in the wilderness. It was the children and grandchildren that were walking around the, the city of Jericho. And day one, they walked, and nothing happened. Day two, they walked, and nothing happened. Day five, they walked, and nothing happened. Day six, they, six, they walked, and nothing happened. Day seven, they went around one time, two times, three times, four times, all the way up to six times, and nothing happened. It takes courageous faith to lead a group of people like that until God decides to work. But on the seventh time, on the seventh day, in Joshua 6.20, it says, when the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. At the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they looked at the city. What are the stories that you have of courageous faith? What are the examples that you have for your children and grandchildren of courageous faith? What stories can you tell? What model do you have for them that, that you are serving the, the Lord God and no matter what the government decides, no matter what entertainment puts to put out, no matter what educators are telling you, no matter what the news media says, the Lord God of Israel reigns and his son, Jesus Christ, came and he lived among us and he died for us to offer us salvation. There's nothing that the world can do to change the truth. But it takes courage to stand on that truth. And that has to be passed on to our children. And then if you turn to Joshua chapter 12, I, I talk about courage, courageous faith, but I'm chicken when it comes to reading in public all the names of the kings that are listed in Joshua chapter 12. And so I'm just going to point you there. There are 31 kings that Joshua and the children of Israel defeated in conquering the land. And you can read that for yourself. If you're at home, if you don't pronounce them right, that's quite all right. But I'm not going to try to wade through those this morning. Okay, the second thing that we notice that, that uh, Joshua is told, he said, God is speaking, be strong and courageous to stand on God's word when it's not popular. God's word is not popular in our culture. God's word is not even popular in many churches. God's word is not even taught and preached in many churches. And so we are called to be strong and courageous and to stand on God's word when other people don't think that it's the right thing for us to do. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, God says to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Now there's a story here in Joshua chapter 7. After the walls of Jericho came down, Joshua sent a few spies up to a small city 
called AI. And they came back and they said, huh, this is a piece of cake. If, if we can bring down the, cares, the, the uh, walls of Jericho, we can take the city of Jericho. We don't even have to send the whole army up. Just send up a few thousand troops. And so they sent up a, th- a few thousand troops and they were routed. And 30-some people were killed and they came running back. And Moses, or, uh, Joshua was, was down on his knees and, and begging God to show him what was wrong. And, and God said, what are you doing down there? I called you to be a leader. What are you, why, why are you groveling? Don't you know that someone in the camp committed sin? You go and you find out who it is and you take care of it. So Joshua called all the people together and in those days they cast lots and God spoke to them through the casting of lots. I don't understand all that, how it worked, but it it came down to a particular tribe and then down to a particular family and then within that family group, one particular person and his name was Achan. And Joshua said to Achan, he said, now, fess up, tell me the truth. What did you do? And that, this is what he was told. Achan, this is in uh, Joshua 7, 20 to 21. You can read the first part that I just went over. You can uh, read that in Joshua 7, verses 2 to 5. But in Joshua 7, 20 and 21, Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, This is what I have done. When I saw the plunder and the beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. The Bible teaches us in the New Testament that the wages of sin is death. That death doesn't come as quickly as it did for Achan in the Old Testament but it's still the same. Achan and his family and all that they had were destroyed. And then Achan, uh, excuse me, then Israel went back to Ai and they destroyed the city easily like the spies had originally said. There's consequences to sin and we need to obey what God's word tells us. In the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 through Chapter 4, verse 5, Paul is writing specifically to Timothy, but he's writing generally to all of us. He says, all scripture is is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, And in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelism, uh, evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. We're living in a time today that fulfills what the Apostle Paul told Timothy there. There are a lot of people who are professed Christians and and would tell you that they're born again, but they do not practice Christianity. They practice syncretism. In other words, they believe Jesus for salvation because they want to go to heaven, but they mix in their daily life all kinds of different ancient religions. It's called New Age, and they're based on... on, uh, Hindu teachings and Confucius teachings and yoga teachings and karma and all of those kinds of things and they mix it all together and they put a cross on top of it and say, I'm a Christian. They are, they're not willing to go to God's word and hear the truth. I want to say this morning that I believe God's word and I try to preach faithfully 
God's word. And I intend to live by God's word. We all come short, but that's my heart. That's my desire. And what I'm saying to all of us is that is what is necessary for us to be able to live godly lives in this culture and to raise godly children and then influence godly grandchildren. It takes courageous faith. I believe every story of God's word. I've preached them for 47 years. I believe every story that the Hebrew writer mentions in Hebrews 11. I believe that God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. I believe that Abel had a better report than his brother. I believe that Enoch walked with God and then he was not. I believe that Noah, a man who had never seen rain, built an ark because God told him to. I believe the stories of Abraham and Sarah and the child of promise that God gave them. And Isaac, who was that child of promise? And Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Deborah and Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. I also, beyond what the Hebrew writer said, I believe that the story of Job is true. I believe that the story of Jonah is true. Jesus even referred to that when talking about his three days in the grave. He said that it's like Jonah who spent three days in the belly of a fish that was specially made for that purpose. And we need the courageous faith of Daniel. We need the the courageous faith of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. We need the courageous faith of Esther in our times. We're not living in the same America. We're not living in the same world that we were raised in in the 20th century and in the early 21st century. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, it will take courageous faith. Is there anybody in the house this morning? We need courageous faith in God's word to help us to be faithful through pain, problems, pandemics, persecution, danger, and death. Because if we don't have courageous faith, we're not going to be able to hold on to our faith. It will be ripped from us. And then the third thing that God says to Joshua is to be strong and courageous, knowing that the Lord will be with you. Be strong and courageous, knowing that the Lord will be with you. God's not going to call us out into this culture and say, now, follow the word of God, and live by the word of God and proclaim the word of God and then turn his back on us when we're in trouble. No, he said to Joshua that the Lord will be with you. In Joshua 1, 9, God says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It's the promise of God. It is the source of the courage. It's not that we are courageous in ourselves, but it's the source of God's presence with us that gives us courage to stand on God's word. Moses had called Joshua to be strong and courageous by reminding him that the Lord would go before him and with him. He will never leave you nor forsake you. God, or Moses told him this in Deuteronomy chapter 31, and now God repeats it again three times right here in this chapter to Joshua. Deuteronomy 31, verses 7 and 8. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their forefathers to give them, and you must divide it among them for their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you 
nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. If you hear all the voices in the world today, it may make us shudder. And we think, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to our children? What's going to happen to our grandchildren? I don't know what all that future is, but I know that Jesus will be with us. God will be with us. He will take our hand and he will lead us through. He'll be in us. He'll be beside us. He'll be before us. He'll be behind us. He will help us to face whatever's ahead. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what the future holds, but we know that it's in God's hands. You need courageous faith to move in the fu- into the future that God has planned for you. You need courageous faith to stand on God's word when it's not popular. You can move into the future standing on God's word knowing, knowing that the Lord will be with you. No matter what happens, he will never leave us nor forsake us. At the end of his lifetime, after all of this had happened through the book of Joshua, he was coming near the end of his life and the end of his leadership. And in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15, he stood up before the people of Israel one last time. And he said, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefather, that your forefathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We we need more than just to pray a prayer in church. We need more than just to have some Bible knowledge and some verses memorized. We need more than just to show up on church, on, to church on Sunday. All of those things are good and they are important. But to face the future that is before us, to walk into the future that God is leading us into, we need courageous faith. I wonder this morning, are there any people here who are willing to stand on God's word and move into the future that he has prepared for us with courageous faith, knowing that the Lord will be with us. If so, stand up if you make that commitment to the Lord this morning. Will we say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Is it scary? Yes. Is it difficult? Yes. But he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He won't abandon our children. He won't abandon our grandchildren. He will go with us. And God's word is just as true today in 2021 as it was when the writers took the pens under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and put it into text. And next year it'll still be true. In a decade it'll still be true. If the Lord tarries, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, God's word will not change. He will not abandon us. And we can move into the future, our personal future, the future of the church, the future of our nation, the future that is beyond our comprehension right now. We can move into it with courage because God's word is true. And he is with us. He is with us. And he will not leave us. Shall we pray? Oh God, we may not have the responsibilities 
of Joshua. But you're calling us into an unknown future. We don't know what will happen yet today or tomorrow or next week or next month or in the years and decades ahead. We don't know. But like the old songwriter said, I don't know who holds the future, but I know who holds my hand. And Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning, whether we're in this room or whether we're watching somewhere else, help us to draw strength. If we think following Jesus is going to be easy, we're greatly mistaken. We need courageous faith, bold faith, strong faith, faith that will not bend, faith that will not break, faith that will not give in, faith that will not be intimidated. Lord, give us faith. And help us to teach our children to have faith. Help us to build memorials of faith, not physical ones, not idols, not stones, but help us to build faith deep into their hearts and that they too would know that the Lord is with them and that he will never, ever abandon them. Lord, we're going out into a dark world where we're called to be light, and where we're called to be salt. It's not easy to stand on truth when the world wants everyone to live by lies. But Lord, give us courageous faith. Send us forth to be your people in this world. And Lord, if there's anyone here who has been tempted to compromise or maybe has already compromised in their faith, I pray that they would turn to you and that they would be restored in their faith. If there's anyone here who doesn't really understand what I'm talking about to, to follow Jesus and to trust him, Lord, I pray that they, their hearts would be open toward you and that they would ask you to be their savior, to restore them to a right relationship with God and forgive their sins. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do his work as your word has gone forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, bless you. So great to see you this morning. I encourage you to stay for the closing song from the worship team. Aren't they great? I, I just appreciate them so much. They've been so, they've been, uh, so faithful. And it, there was an old gospel song years ago. I'm an old man, so I remember all of them. It just keeps getting better and better and better and better. And their leadership, they're, they're coming together as one and singing and playing. And, and the guys upstairs with the technology, it, it's evident that, that they are worshiping the Lord and they help us to worship as well. And we appreciate them this morning. If you can, just stay where you're at. You can stand or sit, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, earlier, they called us to dance. So Luther, if you want to dance, just dance, okay? Praise the Lord. God bless you. You stood before creation. Sin with